see you all. Uh, first song we'll sing this morning will be I Want to Be Ready to Meet Him, number 357, if you're using your songbooks, 357. Let's all sing together. <clears throat> you may have your worldly pleasures, your silver and your gold. You may have
this morning. Our God and our Father in heaven, we are thankful for this time that we have to come together. Come to you this morning through the name of your Son, Jesus. We are mindful of the grace that you did provide to us, that you loved your creation so much that you would allow your Son to come to this earth, that he did live the perfect life as an example for us. But it was because of your grace that you sent him to die for the sins of mankind. We're thankful that he was obedient to your will, that he endured the suffering, the shame, the pain, the agony, that he took our sin to the cross, that he shed his blood, that 2,000 years later we still can have forgiveness of our sins. We're mindful this morning that we come together as a family of believers, not only to remember that sacrifice in a few moments, but that we'll remember that he rose from the grave upon the first day of the week, that he showed himself to the women outside of the tomb, that he showed himself to the apostles that day as proof of the resurrection that he had conquered death, and that your plan of salvation was complete for man if we are obedient to it. As we spend a few moments together this morning in songs, in prayer, and study from your word, we pray that we would do things in accordance with your will. We pray that we would be edified and strengthened by them. We pray that we would be encouraged as we begin a new week to share the good news of your son to this world as we discussed in class this morning, we truly live in a world that is not knowledgeable of your wishes, that is primarily concerned with themselves and their own pleasures, and, and we take time to share the news of your Son and your will for mankind. We're always mindful of those on our list that are in need of physical help, physical healing. We pray that you would be with them. We pray that you would be with those who are spiritually ill. May we to or say something, convince them of their need. We also are mindful that we're human and we fail ourselves and we have sin in our lives and we ask that you would continue to forgive us as we repent of those sins. We ask that you would continue to look down upon us and see our needs and may we always come to you for wisdom, for guidance, for strength and instruction. In your Son, Jesus' name, we offer this prayer. Amen. Amen. Sing number 626, the years I spent in vanity and pride. Follow this song that you will love, partake of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus again.
We'd like to take a moment to pause our busy lives and think about what we're about to partake in. Michael's prayer of praise just clearly stated why we're here. To remember that Jesus came to this earth, God in the flesh, lived an example that we could all follow, and then ultimately laid down his life. In Jesus' short time on the earth, he was asked a question, many questions of testing, and one was, what is the greatest commandment? And of course, Jesus answered, the greatest commandment is love thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and all thy mind. That is the first and greatest commandment. And the second commandment is love your brother like yourself. And so we see this in the embodiment of his life and his death. If his death was done for a reason, then we ought to think about that reason as we partake of the cup. We can talk about the death and the agony and the cross, all the four Gospels described in great detail. But how should we act as we partake of the body and the cup today of Christ? I'd like us to consider how we should act. Paul would say in the Roman church in chapter 5, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which was given to us. Part of Christ's death, part of the things that we remember here today is the gift of the Holy Spirit that God gave us. When we read his word, if you don't feel that spirit move within you, you're not reading it. For when we were without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die, but truly for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commanded his love toward us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus would say in 1 John to John to write, If any man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he's a liar. For he that loved not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God, whom he hath not seen? And this is the commandment that we have from him, that he loveth God, also loveth his brother. And Jesus would say in John chapter 14, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I will pray to the Father, and he shall give you a comforter. Of course, he was saying this to his apostles, but we are also comforted by his words. And he tells the disciples there, it's that spirit of truth that he has given us. Faith, hope, charity. And the greatest of these is charity. Well, of course, that means love. And then finally, Jesus said to his disciples, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we <coughs> consider this time now that we partake of the bread, representing the body that so willingly hung on the cross, representing the words of love, that we should love you with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind, and then love our brother, because you loved us while we were yet sinners. If we recognize this death on the cross, and we don't live these words, and all this is for naught. We pray that you would continue to forgive us as we ask for forgiveness of our sins. And without the sacrifice, our faith would be in vain. We praise you and thank you for this sacrifice. For it's in the name of Jesus I pray.
prepare of taking the cup now. Paul also said to the Roman church in Romans chapter 116, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. The Jew first and also to the Greek. And so this is the gospel of Christ. That Christ was sacrificed, died on the cross, and through the power of God, he was raised again. As we partake of this communion, we remember that we also died in Christ. But we left that old man behind, and we live anew through Christ as we were baptized into him. But we now live in Christ, and one day we'll die and sleep in Christ until he comes again. And if we gather here and take part of this communion, we remember that he will come again and claim his own. And I hope you, like me, want to be part of those that he claims. Let's pray. Oh, our loving God, you loved us so much that you died for us while we were yet sinners. We're humbled by the thought how much grace you've extended to us. And we don't deserve any of it. As we partake of this cup, which represents that blood that was shed, for blood had to be shed in order to forgive our sins. We remember it through this that you remember our shortcomings no more. We praise you. We praise the name of Christ. We partake in this cup. Lord Jesus, I pray. Amen. acceptance to what we do here with the funds, that we might spread the gospel to this community. For the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Yeah. 
for the lesson of the hour this morning. We'll sing number 158, A Hill Called Mount Catherine. Let's all sing together. There are things that we travel this earth So this morning I want to talk a little bit about our need for uh, for friendship, or as thrown out a lot in uh, today's term, I feel like is community, and how it's essential to our lives, especially our lives as Christians. It's something that's ingrained in us. It's almost within our DNA. We're essentially, you know, pack animals. We live in communities. Um, throughout history, humans don't live alone. They live together. Um, you know, one of my favorite TV shows, Lost, has a, a famous line where they said, uh, you know, live together or die alone. And that's, that's essentially true for all of humanity. Um, some of us might want to be, you know, hermits out in the mountain living by ourselves, but very few of us can actually make that, that life work and make that happen. We want to be connected to one another. God created us with this need to share our lives with other people. He wants our friendship uh, to change us and to make us more like him. That's how important friendships are, how much they should change us. When we're with a friend, you discuss, you share things, you share interests, and it's a chance to learn from each other and to grow from each other. Even in disagreement, you may not want to have a friend that you disagree about everything, but you should have a friendship, hopefully, with people that you can agree, disagree about a few things and still have 
a common friendship. Or as Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17 says, Iron sharpens iron, and no, and one man sharpens another. The best friendships are ones that share not just common interests, but also common values, provide trust and encouragement. This is what makes Christian friendship so important. A Christian friendship, hopefully, is something that's precious. Because it's a friend that not only cares just about your life and what's going on in it, but also cares about your soul. So this morning I want to take a look at, of course, one that's well known, but the friendship of David and Jonathan. What we all really want is a genuine and close friendship, and one that is not just an acquaintance. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother, is what Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24 says. You can kind of read that as, a real friend is more loyal even than a brother. Solomon, of course, who wrote these words, you had to imagine, probably learned something about true friend, friendship from his father, from David. And probably a lot of those discussions, I imagine, involved stories involving uh, Jonathan. As a recap, Jonathan was King Saul's oldest son, a warrior, and a man of devoted faith. 1 Samuel chapter 14 tells a story of his heroics, where he and his armor bearer attacked and defeated a Philippine, uh, Philistine outpost. The Lord honored Jonathan's faith and led him to uh, rout the entire Philistine army. Of course, we see David joining the picture after killing Goliath in Samuel chapter 18, verse 1. I'll be reading from that. And as soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the son of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. You can see there was an instant bond formed between the two men. This is formed between mutual respect, as they were both warriors, and because of their devoted faith in God, David's belief that he knew that he could defeat Goliath. Jonathan had that exact same faith. From that moment, the friendship was unique, especially in today's society and among modern men, I'll call, call myself out, who might be more fearful to oftentimes engage in a genuine and open friendship where you talk about your feelings and emotions rather than just interests that you might share with each other. Jonathan goes on, of course, as we see later on in the book, to warn and protect David from his own father. And how many of us would actually go that far for a friend if we knew that our father had well, in this case, you know, the intent to kill David. Finally, he does come even face to face with his own father in 1 Samuel chapter 20. I'll be reading from that if you'd like to turn there. It's 1 Samuel 20, starting in verse 30. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said to him, You son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you have choos chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom shall be established. Therefore send and bring him to me, for he surely shall die. Then Jonathan answered Saul, his father, Why should he be put to death? What has he done? But Saul hurled his spear at him to strike him. So Jonathan knew that his father was determined to put David to death. And Jonathan rose from the table in fierce anger, and ate no food the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David, because his father had disgraced him. So you can see how much of a friend Jonathan was. He put himself essentially in the exact same situation that David had been in, that his own father hurled the spear at him as well. Ultimately, at the end of the story between Jonathan and David, Jonathan is killed, along with his father in 1 Samuel chapter 31. But to start off 2 Samuel chapter 1, we of course see the friendship that's stressed between the two men. In 1 Samuel, or sorry, 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 26, it says, 
or this is what David had said. Jonathan lies slain on your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant have you been to me. Your love to me was extraordinary, surpassing the love of women. Jonathan David obviously provide a picture of what a true friendship should be. Especially one, as I mentioned before, this based on a devoted faith and mutual respect for each other. Part of what brought this lesson to me is because as I've had a child, like many of us have, you start to think about their friendships and what kind of friends you want for them to have. He recently had our, our neighbor, who lives next door, is a close friend of his, moved away, still in the city, but it made me think about how do friendships progress throughout our lives. And many times when you're young, you know, and your parents are still in control of your life, your friendships are pretty much based on proximity. You know, you might have a friend, I bet a lot of you think about who were your close friends growing up. A lot of them probably lived in the same neighborhood or very close to where you were. As you become a teenager and of course into the college years, it becomes mutual interest. You have a lot of the same things in common. But then as you get even older, at least from what I've experienced in my life, is that you start to lean towards people who have the same values and the same ethics that you do, and many times believe the same things that you do. I think we all want that. Finally, and we all saw this coming, of course, I want to turn to a John chapter 15, verse 12, where Jesus talks about his friendship.
thank you, Blair, very much. We do appreciate you coming in and helping us out uh, you know, periodically. It's, it's great to have you here. It's also, uh, I do have a visitor's card. Uh, uh, Clinton, Jessica, Butterfly, and Roxy uh, Arion, is it close enough, uh, uh, are here from Kansas City, and it's great to have them. It's also great to see Sally Clark here, and John, and, and uh, uh, Nancy here. It's, uh, it's just great to feel so much better. How many do we have today? We have, I have it. 56 people here this morning. So I think that's fantastic. Um, I do have a couple of things. Uh, uh, Mark Mitchell uh, was injured his elbow recently, and he's going may end up having to have surgery. So please uh, keep him in our in our prayers. Uh, and uh, also, uh, Larry asked again to be put on on the prayer list. Uh, he's going through things, and he said uh, one great thing about it is prayer works. Amen. Now, one one of the interesting things about the fact that. John and Nancy and Sally, and we've got some visitors here that uh, they all have something in common in, uh, and it has to do a little bit with my one last thing. I remember growing up uh, one summer, we went to Carlsbad Caverns. They took us to a large cavern and they turned out the lights. Complete darkness. It was eerie. Then they turned on a 25 watt bulb. Everyone in this massive cavern focused on one thing, this tiny light. The cavern was beautiful, but we could no longer see its beauty, just the faint light. Being a single light in a dark world can be daunting, but in this world of darkness, we are charged to be that 25 water. Be proud to stand out. Be proud to stand for the hope of a better time, an opportunity to show others there is a better way. When, we, when others see you, your light shines. Their lights begin to shine. And others, and others. Pretty soon, illumination displays the wonders of the people of this world. And the people of this world can be beautiful when given a purpose, a reason to be here. I thank God for being the light of our world. John 8, 12 says, and again, uh, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness but we'll have the light of life. In just a second, I'm going to dismiss us in prayer, but I wanted to say thank you all for being here today with us. It's encouraging to see uh, so many here this morning. And uh, those that are home, I want to thank Don and, and uh, those that are working here in the front to provide a live stream to those that are still home. James is helping us too. Uh, next week, Don is going to be traveling, so we we'll pray for Don Pat as they travel. Uh, Tommy Herkin is traveling this weekend, so we uh, pray for him and others that might be traveling. I uh, want to continue to pray for us here as we continue to fight this virus that we begin to open up things we might uh, collect some more together. And I wanted to announce that we're working on it. Uh, a new program called the Church of Christ Singers. And we'd like to invite everybody that wants to sing, or even if you think you might be able to sing a little bit, to gather with us. And uh, Don and I are working on some things to uh, audio and video those sessions so that we can start providing our own Church of Christ Singers up here on the screen. And uh, we have a lot of good singers here. With that, we also know that Jerry and Lindy are going to be leaving soon, and that breaks our heart. Are they still here? Oh, there's Lindy. And uh, we made this announcement next last week that Lindy wasn't here, so I wanted to make an announcement again. It's in the bulletin, but they are expecting another baby, and they're going to have a here's going to be, it's going to be a little girl. In the memory of their trip here. They said they're going to name it Patty. Michael, do you have any comments? Here? <laughs> Isn't that a wonderful gesture as they depart and name the baby Patty? <laughs> uh, they probably are. Um, so we want to.
also congratulate them and thank them and encourage our visitors to come here today and uh, we thank you for visiting with us. Um, as we begin to think about prayer, as uh, we talk about friendship, thank you for that lesson. Kind of follow up with what, what I was saying in the communion thoughts, we are to love one another. Uh, we want to consider those that are in our prayers. And as Larry said, prayer does work. And uh, Patty's sister Barbara is out of the hospital. Prayer of Thanksgiving there. Uh, Nicole, we continue to pray for her. Uh, Stella's brother-in-law, Greg, and sister Janice, Susan, who's at home, uh, no watching, we continue to pray for her, uh, Gina and her family, and uh, Jerry, who's at home and getting better, and I know there's people behind the scenes working with Jerry, and uh, we won't mention them, but we do know those things. I want to thank all those that work behind the scenes here. Uh, we don't often say thank you enough. The wonderful bulletin we have here this morning, we take for granted. Uh, those people that prepare the bulletin are here today. So again, I want to say thank you. We don't say it enough. Um, Kareem, Danny, Pat, his brother Steve, Marion's father, Jack, who was here last week, uh, continue to think of them. Uh, James's father, Teresa's mother, and all those people that we often mention in our prayers, but we don't always remember to think of them. So let's consider that now. We'll close out in prayer. Our most gracious, loving, heavenly Father, hallowed would be thy name. Thy kingdom has come, and we look for that time when we might be with you in heaven. And that is why we gather here this morning to encourage one another to provide an insulation from the outside world that has looked the other way. And we pray that you would bless those who have come here today and give them safe travels home, comfort <coughs> them, and encourage them throughout the week as we go back into the world. And we thank you for the gift that you've given us in your word, in your song, how it hits our soul as we sing to you. For those that have come here and expressed what they've studied, whether it be uh, what we studied in Bible class or the lesson this morning, we thank you for those that have taken the time to share what they've learned to us all. We thank you for our visitors. We thank you for our family. We ask that you be with our sick that we've mentioned, that you would give them the physical uh, attendance that they need, and also for our spiritual sick, Father, that you would always help us remember to encourage one another who might be dipping, and uh, we know that the evil one is always on the outside trying to get in. Father, we thank you for this country. We take it for granted. We take, thank you for those that defend our country. Uh, we also pray for Jeff. And as he's, he's traveling to see his father, we pray that that outcome might be a good one. And Father, we thank you for the church that gathers here that we might be able to share the good news that Christ died and arose for our sins. It's for Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.